I'm Michelle Ackley. My parents both grew up on council estates, and as a family, we understand the difference social housing can make to people's lives. Millions of families across the UK are struggling to find affordable housing. So this is my front room and my bedroom together. Many are living in temporary or overcrowded conditions, desperate for somewhere decent to live. This is our room where we sleep, and this is what we've got at the minute. We can't really call it our home. But some social housing tenants are abusing the system, holding on to properties they no longer need. When somebody applies for housing, you expect them to live in a property, and, and they don't. It does start to take the mickey. Or even worse, making a small fortune by illegally subletting them. He was charging beyond £1,500 a month. He exploited this completely to his advantage. So I'm with housing investigators cracking down on tenancy cheats. What a waste. If you want to commit tenancy fraud, don't bother coming here. Reclaiming properties. I need to uh, speak to you, please. They have seen an opportunity and they think they're not going to get caught. And giving them to families in genuine need. That's how a councillor should be. It should be loved and looked after. This is Council House Crackdown. Today, the illegal migrant who conned his way into a council flat and shamelessly swindled tens of thousands of pounds from the public purse. This man had a level of arrogance that convinced him that what he was doing was, was right. He was absolutely convinced of that. And, you know, I don't see that in every fraudster. And even when caught, his lies kept coming. The first time the bailiff did attend the property, Mr Okachukwu told the bailiff that he was dying. An illegal subletter who secretly altered a house to make thousands of pounds in profits. I've never really seen a property where a tenants made such adaptations to it where we have to go in there and literally nearly rip it apart again just to make it safe and habitable for the next person to go in. And a tenant abusing the system by subletting his council flat to his brother while he was living back with his parents. I had to make the decision there whether he was maybe playing dumb. With so many people on the waiting list in desperate need of social housing, cracking down on those who deliberately set out to cheat the system is a priority. In some cases, those cheats are quickly rooted out. But in others, the deception is so determined and difficult to unravel, it can take years. Our first case involves this man, convicted con man Kenny Chukwu Okachukwu, who arrived in the UK on a six-month visa and ended up cheating his way to getting a council flat and £47,000 in benefits. This man had a level of arrogance that convinced him that what he was doing was, was right. There's absolutely nothing wrong in ripping off the British taxpayer at all. He was absolutely convinced of that. and. You know, I don't see that in every fraudster. Mr Okachukwu applied to Croydon Council for a social housing property in 2002, claiming to be homeless. On his application form, he said he was British, and back then, the council took him at his word. Croydon Council's Gail Campbell was a key investigator on the case. Let's talk about the lead-up to Mr Okachukwu getting a council house property. How did that happen in the first place? He'd um, filled the form out completely. He'd given his name and he said that he was British. Had he put something else on the form that maybe highlighted that he was not British or didn't originate from the UK, further questions would be asked. And what kind of council property was he given? Um, he was given a flat in a block, a first-floor flat, one-bedroomed, it was quite nice. Suited his needs? It suited his needs, yes. He didn't have anybody else on his application that he declared needed to live with him. He wanted to be on his own, that's what he said. On the surface, he appeared to be a model tenant. So this is a guy that's been under the radar for 10 years in this council property. Do you think, you know, if you're going to commit fraud, be a tenancy cheat, that this is the best way to go about it, doing what he did, just trying to keep a, a low profile and not mudging any waters. Absolutely. By behaving yourself um, and not drawing attention to yourself can get away with so much because you're not causing 
anybody to, to look at you closely. You're, you're not causing any of the council staff or, or given any reason why they need to look at you. But the truth was, he'd been released from prison two years earlier, having served time for ID fraud and deception. He should have been deported, but instead he evaded authorities before making a successful application for this council flat. As a council tenant, what was he like? He didn't create, he didn't ask for anything. Um, while he was the tenant, there was nothing significant. Mr Okachukwu lived there for well over a decade until a home office check revealed that he was a failed asylum seeker who had absconded before being deported. So when the alarm bells started ringing, how did you go about the investigation? Once um, we were in receipt of the um, home office information, and the important fact that he was a failed asylum seeker, he had been served paperwork, he was due to re um, report, he had restrictions on him, and he had never been entitled to the public funds whatsoever. So once we were aware of that, the first thing that we needed to do was to suspend any benefit payments that are being made to him. And it wasn't just benefits he wasn't entitled to. As an illegal migrant, he had no right to a social housing property. And further checks by Gail and the fraud investigation team revealed that Mr Okachukwu on paper appeared to be a successful businessman. Once we've be um, become aware that he has some limited companies, we've done a search. He's been a director um, for these companies here. Um, they're all now dissolved. And how did this help with your case, having this, this information? When it comes to the benefit application forms, he would need to declare that. He would need to declare that he runs a company. It's up to the council to decide if the income that he receives from any of these companies should be um, included in the calculations for his benefits. OK. But at the time, he hadn't declared any of these companies. They also found that Mr Okachukwu was registered with Companies House as the owner of a business that appeared to be still active. But what we also did was we were able to look um, at more precisely at one of the companies that he had registered on Company House, valued at £1 million. £1 million? Yeah. This is not someone that's in desperate need of social housing? Probably not. Croydon's head of fraud, David Hogan, was shocked by the level of deception. This was a multi-layered case, wasn't it? Uh, and some elements are quite surprising, especially how Mr Okachukwu lived his life and just went about his, his daily routine. Yeah, really, for somebody who presented to the council as somebody, uh, you know, in need, he actually had quite a nice lifestyle. You know, he drove a Mercedes car, he ran this import-export company, um, you know, and he actually presented himself through Facebook and other channels as a successful businessman. Even though Companies House showed Mr Okachukwu was the director of a company worth a million pounds on paper, he'd still managed to claim housing benefit amounting to almost £40,000 and council tax benefits of just over £7,000. On May the 18th, 2015, Mr Okachukwu was invited to attend an interview under caution at Croydon Council. He was very combative. Um, this was not somebody who was going to take being challenged lying down. At times he was aggressive. This man had a level of arrogance that convinced him that what he was doing was, was right. There's absolutely nothing wrong in ripping off the British taxpayer at all. He was absolutely convinced of that. And, you know, I don't see that in every fraudster. And he came prepared, using his knowledge of the system to attempt to fool them again. This is the paperwork that he brought which he, as a clever man, tried to convince the investigations officers that this document gives him leave to remain in the UK and that because he's had that document for such a long time, he's now British. Which doesn't really make any sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. And the document only refers on the back page to employment. So basically what that stamp says um, on a clearer version is that you can work um, while your claim has been decided. I it see. does not give him permission to claim anything from the public 
public purse and it doesn't tell him anywhere that he's got leave to remain in the UK and can class himself as a British subject. Croydon Council had heard enough and served their tenant with an eviction notice. He had two months to hand his keys back. Later, the determined fraudster finally faced eviction. Really only got to know what he's all about on the day that we evicted him. But his lies kept coming. Mr. Rockinchuk, who said that he was dying and that the bailiff had to go and allow him to die. The most common form of tenancy fraud is the unlawful subletting of a council or social housing property. For an unscrupulous tenant, subletting can be a potential money spinner. And in some cases, they'll go to extraordinary lengths to maximise their unlawful profits. In our next case, a woman converts her three-bedroom council house to create five bedrooms in order to generate tens of thousands of pounds in unlawful profits. We do occasionally encounter people who sublet properties. Obviously, the vast majority of our tenants are genuine, and, and they don't. But in this case, the tenant had made a lot of changes to the property and gone to a lot of trouble to maximise the profit that she could make from this property. The story started in 1986 when a family of four applied to Cambridge City Council for social housing. They were allocated a three-bedroom family home. The council's head of fraud is James Stevens. Cambridge is an affluent city with a mix of social and private housing. This particular area is social housing. Uh, it's a very nice area, very pleasant, very close to the city centre. <laughs> But in the year 2000, the family separated. One of the partners left the household with the children and the remaining tenant was left in a three-bedroom council house. The woman remaining in the property informed the council of her change in circumstances. By law, even though she was occupying a family home, she was within her rights to continue living there. As Cambridge City Council was still receiving their £520 per month in social rent, they had no cause for concern. But then, in 2014, the council became suspicious. We were approached by an individual who was inquiring about the possibility of being housed by the council. The individual concerned gave an address down this road as their current occupancy. And that was the point at which we, we had concerns because as far as we were concerned, it, there was just a single council tenant living at that address. Investigators looked at the council tax records for the property and they were surprised to find several names registered as living there, despite the fact it was supposed to be a single occupancy. Alarm bells ring as soon as we see other names linked to the address because there's no reason that other names should be linked to the address. Fraud investigator Chris Schofield started looking into the case and decided to invite the individual who claimed to be living in their council tenancy in for a chat. She initially came in and spoke to me freely, uh, gave me information about who was staying there, how long she had been staying there, how much rent they were paying, and the most important fact, that the landlady, who they called the landlady, was actually our tenant, was not living there. So if the tenant wasn't really living at the property, then this was an unlawful sublet. In order to progress the case with no witness statements, Chris needed some hard evidence. At that point, I then thought it would be very important to take a statement from her because Potentially, we could use that in evidence if the case ever went to court. Um, I asked the tenant if they would give a statement, and they declined at that point. That's not uncommon in cases of sublet. With the subtenant unwilling to make a formal witness statement, the council was faced with proving a case without them. It is very difficult if the subtenants don't come forward because then we don't have the evidence that we need to take the case to court. 
But the fraud team led by James Stevens were determined to get their property back and bring their tenant to justice. We take these things very seriously. Social housing is at a premium in Cambridge, and it's very, very important for us to take all reasonable steps to try and get the properties back. Later, the extent of the tenant's deception becomes apparent. So this is quite an unusual case from our point of view. We had an individual who'd actually made alterations to the property in order to maximise her income from it, which was being subsidised by the public. In South London, Rundle Housing Association provides over 7,000 social housing homes across nine boroughs, including Bromley. Wandle's average social rent for a one-bedroom property in this area is less than £700 per month. That's just over half what you'd expect to pay on the private rental market. Which means it's all the more important that local authorities ensure every social housing property is in the hands of someone who really needs it. Our next case involves an unlawful subletter who cheated the system out of a much-needed council property whilst he lived back at home with his parents. I had to make a decision there whether he was maybe playing dumb. It all began here in Beckenham, in the London borough of Bromley, in this one-bedroom flat owned by Wandle Housing. So we're in a, a fairly leafy suburb of south-east London. We're right on top of a uh, rail station that takes you straight into the centre of London. Um, so it's quite sought after. Fraud prevention specialist Robert Kleinberg led the investigation after receiving an anonymous tip-off that their property was being unlawfully sublet. Their official tenant should have been a single male who'd been granted the property back in 2012. The council decided to make an unannounced visit to see who was living there. The housing officer uh, made a visit. She said she had concerns that the tenant wasn't being completely open with her with the circumstances. She wasn't sure what the details were, but it didn't add up. Something didn't seem right. Robert and his fraud prevention team conducted some basic credit checks on the address. So I saw that we had another name associated with the property. It was the same surname, but different first names and a female name as well. So two weeks later, Robert made a surprise early morning visit to the property. On the morning of my unannounced visit to the tenancy address, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. When Robert knocked on the door, a couple answered. It was the tenant's brother and sister-in-law, but there was no sign of the tenant. Robert was invited in and took the opportunity to have a good look around. It's a one-bedroom property, um, so part of what I had to look at was confirm that was our tenant living there and then was there anybody else living there. And as the pictures dictate, you could see from the lounge, very sizeable lounge, uh, but it just had a two-seater sofa with an armchair desk and a television and one bedroom. And the bedroom had in it just one double bed, but they had also put up a cot because they were expecting within the next couple of months a baby. So I, what I took from that was that these were the two people that were living there. There wasn't a third person living there. It was clear the tenant didn't live here, but his brother did offer an explanation and was prepared to put it on record. Here's the witness statement I took from the tenant's brother, our subtenant on the day, uh, explaining I am currently living with my wife and they've lived there as their main and principal home. It was at the time they moved in, his brother, and gives his brother's name again, moved into their parents' property because the financial arrangements were such that he paid his brother an X amount over a calendar month uh, to cover the rent. Uh, which was transferred from his account to his brother's account and gave his brother's details. Um, he also states that uh, he pays the additional costs for renting the property, such as the internet and council tax. The subtenant admitted that his brother, the official tenant, wasn't living there, but they didn't seem to think they were doing anything wrong. And they were quite adamant to make the point that they weren't 
paying the brother over the odds. They were just covering the cost of the property, which they thought was just a financial arrangement that suit both of their needs. But the couple were benefiting from social housing they weren't entitled to and the below market rent. I had to make the decision there whether he was maybe playing dumb. But there was one more shock for the fraud team. At the end, as he says, I have a property which I own, but it is being let out as it is not suitable for me or my brother. Both my wife and I work full time, which is what he confirmed, so the arrangement suits both ours and my brother's needs. This may have suited their needs, but this was tenancy fraud. Their tenant was unlawfully subletting his property and his brother was benefiting from it. The alarming thing for me was when I presented him with the evidence, you know, they've got options. They weren't going to be homeless. They could have lived there with the parents as well, but it's only because it was very difficult space-wise. As well as the fact that the brother had already told me that they owned another property as well. Robert decided to confront their tenant face to face. On arrival at the parents' address, uh, the door was answered by the mother. I explained who I was and the reason for my visit, which she seemed quite shocked by, and went and got her son, who ushered me then into the family front room. And um, it was evident that he didn't want his mum or parents to find out what had been going on. Confronted with the evidence, the tenant admitted he wasn't staying at the address, but because he wasn't profiting from the sublet, he claimed he didn't know he was doing anything wrong. Although it was uh, claimed by the two brothers to have been approached innocently, they'd actually been profiting from the benefits of social housing that had been put aside for one of them. Wandel Housing's priority was to get their misused property back and into the hands of someone in genuine need. They decided not to launch any criminal charges as long as the tenant gave his keys up immediately. It certainly hit home so when I was sitting down explaining it to him he, and, he's, and his eagerness to sign it back. And, and certainly as I was leaving, hearing the mum who had overheard the conversation shouting at him, um, it was nice that we got it signed back and we didn't have to go through the courts to do so. Just one week later, the property was redecorated and given to an elderly lady in genuine need of social housing. In Croydon, South London, there are around 14,000 social housing properties, but with over 4,500 families on the council waiting list, it's vital that those abusing the system are brought to justice. Earlier, we heard about Kenny Chukwu Okachukwu, a shameless fraudster who conned authorities out of £47,000 in benefits, whilst also cheating them out of a much-needed council flat. This man had a level of arrogance that convinced him that what he was doing was, was right. There's absolutely nothing wrong in ripping off the British taxpayer at all. He was absolutely convinced of that, and, you know, I don't see that in every fraudster. Croydon Council's fraud team had to put a stop to Mr Okachukwu's benefit claims. Now they wanted to get their flat back. On August the 17th, 2015, a judge ruled in their favour and an eviction date was set. Really only got to know what he's all about on the day that we evicted him. The first time the bailiff did attend the property, Mr Okachukwu told the bailiff that he was dying um, and that bailiff decided that he wasn't going to proceed that day and he withdrew. The convicted con man was willing to exploit every trick in the book to keep hold of the property. By continuing to claim he was seriously ill, he managed to defer two planned evictions. However, on the third appointment um, for the eviction, Mr Okichok, we made a, an application to the court that morning and that meant that we, as the council, had to hurriedly defend that and attend court and again fight um, for the possession of the property. Mr Okichukwu attended Croydon County Court and attempted to convince the judge he should be able to stay in the property. 
But Croydon Council's fraud team's evidence was overwhelming. It became apparent, I think, to Mr Okichukwu that he wasn't going to succeed, he wasn't going to get anywhere by trying to plead his case, and, and he became uh, deflated uh, to the extent that there was no fight left in him and the judge ordered that we immediately go and repossess the property. The tenant was granted an hour to collect his belongings and leave. After five months of investigation, three failed evictions and numerous court letters, the tenacity of the fraud investigation team had paid off. On September the 21st, 2015, Croydon Council finally had their keys back. It must be quite satisfying to, to reach a positive solution with a case like this and a man who behaved as he did. Yeah, it is. You know, when somebody is absolutely determined they're going to get the better of you and they're going to continue... You know, when you look back at what he did, he took housing off of someone who really needed it, um, which, to my mind, is just despicable. To, to lie to achieve that, to put yourself up the ladder above somebody else, um, it's a dreadful thing to achieve the outcome we achieved, which was to get our property back. I, I, you know, I, yes, I see it as a great success. Astonishingly, Mr Okachukwu wasn't finished there. He went back to the council, a different department this time, and started making new claims for assistance. He presented himself to the council as a destitute man with a disability. The council actually had to put him in a bed and breakfast. He's quite an intelligent man when you think about it, isn't he? Because he is really trying to squeeze absolutely everything he can out of the system. Even when it's clear, just as clear as day, that he's in the wrong. When one door shut, he'd find something else um, and, a, and another way in, mm. and the council carried on to support him. So his um, bed and breakfast rent was paid, as well as um, subsistence payments, because he needed now money to buy food. So it continued, mm. and it continued. He was playing the system and knew every loophole. The bed and breakfast that he was placed in initially wasn't good enough for him, and he complained about that to the degree that he had to be moved somewhere else because that bed and breakfast wasn't, it wasn't good for him. His disability was so excessive that he couldn't live there. But the council's fraud team eventually found out that failed asylum seeker Mr Okachukwu was still brazenly attempting to con the council. What was your reaction to this? Because it just seemed so cheeky. Did it surprise you when more things would be coming in from Mr Okachukwu requesting things, complaining about things, and just generally being a hassle for the council? What, what were your thoughts and feelings on that? I think that was his game. We've now removed him from the house. We've removed all the benefits from him. He has no source of income coming in from, from any of that now. Um, he now, to me, has decided that he's, he's going to become a pest. He's going to burden us with emails that all need to be answered and responded to, complaints that he's making to various teams within the council. But for Mr Okachukwu, the game was finally up. Croydon Council contacted the Home Office. On June the 17th, 2016, Kenny Chukwu Okachukwu was arrested. Ten days later, he was deported, sent back to Lagos, Nigeria. Mr Okachukwu is out of the property now. How does it feel knowing that there's a deserving family or individual in there instead. Being able to accommodate a, a deserving family in the property, um, that's what the property is there for. It, it's there to house somebody, and I'm sure that whoever's in that property now is enjoying it. Head of fraud David Hogan was delighted to finally get Mr Okachukwu off their books. How did you feel when he was finally sentenced, evicted, and then deported? I mean, I felt very relieved the investigation officers have put a lot of work into, a lot of time into getting the evidence to build that case against him to achieve that outcome. So I'm very, very happy for them, very happy for Croydon Council as well, because, you know, quite frankly, 
losing the requirement to support Mr Okachukwu um, has saved us a lot of money. And uh, I mean, that's why I get up in the morning and come to work. It's to, it's to stop the people who have, you know, taken property from someone who deserves it and give it to that person who really needs it. Yeah, it really is to make a difference. Closing the case on Mr Okachukwu is one small victory. But with over 2,000 families with children in temporary accommodation, the housing crisis is continuing to deepen in this part of South London. The housing crisis is really bad in Croydon. You know, there's an influx of people as well. There's more, more pressure, larger populations, putting pressure on other areas because people have to move out to other areas to find housing. A lot of people living in just, you know, beds, sits, whole families, that sort of thing. Um, before they, it's a long time often before they're, you know, being given a social housing because there's such a, a waiting list. I was in temporary housing for two years, and uh, and it was it was harsh because the conditions are really poor. In Cambridge, there are over 7,000 social housing properties. But with a current waiting list of over 2,000 families, it's all the more important that every property available is being put to the best possible use. Earlier, we heard about a tenancy cheat who was raking in tens of thousands of pounds by unlawfully subletting her enviable three-bedroom council property. Cambridge City Council's fraud team had tracked down one of her subtenants, but she was unwilling to go on the record against her landlady. It is very difficult if the subtenants don't come forward because then we don't have the evidence that we need to take the case to court. So with powers employed through the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act, investigator Chris Schofield delved into the tenant's financial records. This included gaining credit reference checks on the address and the tenant, and also applying for bank statements. The tenant's bank statement actually links five people paying regular payments for many years to the tenant's bank accounts. 430, 430 pounds, 640, 650, um, and these all add up to, to a large sum that have gone into the tenant's bank account. If the tenant had sublet all five rooms at these rates, she could have unlawfully pocketed up to £2,700 a month, or over £32,000 a year. With all the evidence they needed, the tenant was served with a notice to quit and given 28 days to give the keys back. Well, as social housing investigators, it's a privilege for us to actually be able to take steps that mean that we can get properties back for members of the public who desperately need to be housed in this and other cities around the country. There's a legal aspect to this, clearly, but there's also a moral issue as well. They got the property back, but the fraud team weren't going to let it end there. They also decided to put together a criminal case. So on August the 7th, 2014, they invited their tenant in for an interview under caution but she continued to deny any wrongdoing. Following the uh, interview under caution with the tenant, the subtenant that came in was actually then evicted from the property by the landlady, um, for which reason we don't know why. She then attended the city council again and wanted to give us more information. And at that time, I actually managed to persuade her to give me a statement, which at that time was a, a really a breakthrough because that's what we needed to kind of be able to progress the case to court. Having a witness statement along with financial records from a subtenant was a vital building block in their case against their tenant. You can see from the statement that she gave that she clearly says that she was paying for two rooms in the property and to this date she had made the payments of 650 and 635 to the tenant's bank account by backs transfer. The subtenant's bank statements prove the transfer of funds to the tenant's account. 
This actually shows um, very specifically um, rent going in to the account of the tenant for the value of £650 on a particular date. And it's actually even been referenced here with the code RENT. The bank records showed that over a two and a half year period, the subtenant had been paying the council's official tenant nearly £1,300 a month. Meanwhile, the tenant had been paying social rent of just £120 a week, giving her a clear profit of just under £800 a month. This is a large amount of money, and in my time of doing this job, this is the most net profit I've seen. With this new evidence at hand, Chris gave the tenant one final chance to avoid a lengthy court battle. She denied it and upheld that she was still living in the property. At that point, we then decided that we would progress the case to a court. On December the 4th, 2014, at Cambridge Magistrates Court, the tenant was charged with unlawful subletting under the Prevention of Social Housing Fraud Act. But on the day of the trial, the tenant had yet another surprise in store. And before the actual trial went ahead, two solicitors from either side met to discuss the case, and it was indicated to us quite urgently that the tenant had decided that instead of facing court, they wanted to ask us if we would accept the property back um, and not take the case any further. Wishing to avoid further trial costs, the council agreed to the offer. This is quite an attractive um, opportunity for the council. Uh, this avoids us going through a full trial, uh, potentially of days, which is a massive cost to the taxpayer. So our main goal here is really to get the properties back from these people that aren't using them properly and put them back into the, into the city council system and get people who really need them back in the property. The council agreed to settle out of court on the condition the tenant surrendered her keys and reimbursed the legal costs of around £2,000. For the council, this was a great result. We got a property back that we desperately need in the city. For myself and the fraud team, of course, we worked very hard on this case. And personally, I kind of do this job because I want to help people, I want to help the community and get properties back that people are misusing. So for me, it was a great achievement. The council were keen to get this three bedroom property back into circulation as quickly as possible. But once inside, they realised it was going to be a far bigger job than they expected. These are some photos that were actually taken after the city council received the property back into its possession um, some weeks after the court case. Um, obviously, we were very shocked to find the property in the state it was in. Never really seen a property where tenants made such adaptations to it, where we have to go in there and literally nearly rip it apart again just to make it safe and habitable for the next person to go in. The three-bedroom property had been extended and divided into what appeared to be five separate bedrooms, which included adding a staircase to the loft. For head of fraud James Stevens, it was obvious what the tenant's intentions had been. So this is quite an unusual case from our point of view. What had happened in this case was we had an individual who'd actually made alterations to the property in order to maximise her income from it, which was being subsidised by the public. She was making a considerable amount of money from subletting various rooms within her property whilst paying the council a, a fair local price in order to rent the single accommodation unit from us. The three-bedroom house had been adapted into five individual bedsits. It'll take the council several weeks and thousands of pounds to return the property to its original state. But their former tenant won't be getting away with it lightly. They're now pursuing her for these costs. It is very frustrating, um, but in the end of the day, we got the property back and we ended what was going on and what happened for a long period of time. That was the main thing. Moving forward, we're in a position that we're happy with now, and we're really happy with the new family in there. And they're consistently paying our rent legitimately, um, and we couldn't be happier. The stark fact is, across the UK, there's not enough social housing to meet demand, so councils will often put people in temporary accommodation while they wait for a suitable property to become available. But sometimes that wait can be a long one.
Meet single mum Justine. She moved into temporary accommodation with her 15-year-old daughter Angelina one and a half years ago. Yeah, so this is my front room and my bedroom together. Um, it's not ideal because obviously my, my daughter and myself are quite aware that I'm sleeping in the front room as well as it being a front room. And my daughter feels very sort of, and myself feel a little bit embarrassed. Justine and her daughter became homeless in 2015, and they've been on ones with Council's housing list ever since. With two bedroom properties in short supply, as emergency aid, they were offered a temporary one bedroom flat, and they've been here ever since. But even this costs £675 a month, and Justine works full time earning the minimum wage in an attempt to make ends meet. When I get my wages, which would roughly be about £800 a month, £123 has to go on your Oyster card for travelling on the trains. You might have your telly, you know, food, clothes, um, dinner money for Angelina, so there's not really much left. But, you know, living in London, everything is expensive. Justine gets some help towards the costs, but life is increasingly becoming a daily struggle and she's not alone. Across the capital, there are more than 50,000 homeless families living in emergency housing, such as hostels and B&Bs. Many London councils are relocating homeless families outside the capital. It's a controversial policy. But for Justine, living in London with her daughter Angelina is proving to be unsustainable. She's desperate to find a solution and has recently signed up with Home Finders, a company that matches people with social housing properties in other parts of the country. A lady phoned me up and she showed me lots of lovely properties outside the borough, like Liverpool, Manchester, Middleton, and she was extremely polite and she was very nice and it gave me a lot of hope. And the door was not closed. I didn't, you know, I felt like there's another route apart from being in this, even though it's a big step to take. And it is a big step. Justine was born and bred in London, and the prospect of uprooting her daughter from school in search of a better quality of life is a daunting one. But she feels she's got no choice. I mean, the rent, look at the rent. Look at the rent here, £97.62. Plus you get your big garden. You're not gonna get that in Croydon. The good thing is your wages would remain the same out of London, so the properties would be affordable and they're not going to put you in that position of sort of putting you in properties that you can't afford and they will put you in places where you can manage. So that takes a big weight off of your shoulders. Justine's home finding search is in its early days, but she has high hopes of finding a suitable property soon. For so many people caught up in the housing crisis, these are difficult and desperate times, which is why it's more important than ever that housing fraud investigators continue in their crackdown on tenancy cheats, reclaim their properties and re-let them to people in genuine need. Now I drop